and to Experimedia. My name is Hamish Curry. I'm the Education Manager here. And welcome to Collection Reflection. Uh, Collection Reflection is a series that is designed to engage uh, you, the public, with some of the more, I suppose, um, rare and obscure areas of the State Library's collections. Things that you can freely see here, but more often than not, people don't take the opportunity to see. And so far in the series, we've um, had a number of talks from creative fellows. And um, our guest tonight, Morris Leitzman, of course, um, was one of those creative fellows in 2008. And through that fellowship uh, and through different research projects that those fellows do, they either uncover um, interesting new secrets or interesting new stories by using uh, the library's collections. And we've brought along tonight um, some related items from our collection, um, but probably don't always directly relate to specific books that, that, that Morris used, but I'll, I'll let him share with you the, some of the reasons for that. Um, but certainly... Um, Morris Gleitzman probably needs no introduction um, as, as someone that has been writing uh, and publishing novels since the early 1980s and um, I believe now you've published almost 30 novels, I think I'm, we've reached Morris. My 31st actually is coming out in September. There we go. So um, I suppose the first place to start, Morris, would be to ask what you remember about being here at the library in 2008. Well... I remember, I remember the day somebody whispered in my ear that if you filled out a very long application form and were very lucky, you could get for six or even 12 months, if you were extremely lucky, an office here in the State Library, which I, I had no idea such a, a fellowship scheme existed. And, um, and as a long-time visitor to the library for research and self-improvement purposes, I thought this, this sounded like the, the, best, the best idea I'd heard for a long time. So I filled out that long form and kept my fingers crossed. And, uh, and indeed, I did get the use of one of the little research fellowship offices here for a whole 12 months. And it was a fantastic experience because although I'm a, something of a newcomer to research, um, I've tended only really in, in the books I've written over the last few years to need to do a lot of research. Um, most of my earlier books were set in contemporary Australia in, in, in the sort of um, either the, the suburban or country, down, c c country town um, environments that I was quite familiar with. But I guess about um, seven or eight years ago, I started writing stories that, that needed research and that's, that's when I became a frequent visitor to here. So to have the luxury of... Um, a desk and and a space and most importantly access to the fantastic collections here I was allowed to actually just go and take stuff off shelves and have them piled up in my little cubicle um, if you'd poked your head in by about day three of my my residency here you'd have noted that I seem to have more books piled up in my room than any person could possibly um, open let alone read in a year and this is because um, as I explained when I was asked to, to be a part of th these talks, my research approach is far less disciplined than most of the other fellows I met while I was here, most of the other people probably speaking in this program. Although I do know how to go looking for specific pieces of information once I'm engaged, once I've embarked on a story and I, and, and I know I need to either check or discover certain um, pieces of information. Research for me is often a case of being in close proximity to a whole lot of information and ideas I knew nothing about until I, I stumbled on the books on the shelves. And the three books that I researched during that year, I didn't write them all, I only wrote one of them, but I, I researched three. There are, there are things in all three of those books that are only there because of that many happy hours I spent wandering among the stacks and bumping accidentally into books and the ideas and information in them, some of them with no direct relevance, one might think, to the subject matters I was researching, but in all sorts of unexpected and delightful ways. They, um, and and, and I, I'll elaborate on that a bit later in our time together, but in all sorts of ways, um, my, my creative process was expanded by... The, by, by the wonderful opportunity to 
to have these accidental sort of meetings with with books and other materials whose existence I I, I didn't know about, and I know probably um, probably that would be frowned on because it's not the most efficient way to use this library. Um, they're, they've got a wonderful catalog system and some superbly helpful department heads who can save you most of the hours that I spent sort of ricocheting around the stacks. But I have to say, for me, that the, the ricochet method um, was, was very, very fruitful. So, and I guess that idea of having these pile of books and these, having these chance discoveries wandering around the library, um, do you find that that has been a process that you think you're going to adopt from now on for, for writing future books? Well, I think so. Um, I'm burdened slightly by no, no longer having access to an office here. Um, hint, hint. But, um, but, they, but They were just up there, actually. The, the, the yeah. <laughs> but, but only very slightly burdened because, of course, um, uh, the access actually is wonderfully democratic and it's available to us all. Um, it, one just has to, as a member of... Now I'm back in sort of c- civilian um, clothing. I have to sort of do what everyone else has to do and, you know, I actually have to sort of show my card and have stuff um, brought and, and, you know, leave it here when I go home. That's the saddest thing of all. But, um, but yeah, it's, I think I now realise it's, it's to a certain extent how I've always worked. But, um, but because the books that I was researching while I was here, um, in one case, um, it, it, was, it involved a period of history that, uh, at which I couldn't be physically present. So the research was necessary. In another case, um, it, it involved some contemporary experiences that I didn't have firsthand involving the, um, the terrible bushfire of, of um, February last year. So again, um, I was dependent on, on the words and the, um, and the thoughts and feelings of people who were actually there. And in some cases, I connected firsthand with the people, but in many cases, I found their words and, and their experiences through materials here in the library. And, um, but the great thing about libraries is that leaning up against the, the books and the documents that you know exist because the catalogue tells you so and you know that they're going to be of interest to you, always leaning up against them um, is material that you don't know about because, you, because the catalogue doesn't tell you what's leaning up against but when you go and wander along the shelf, you see what's... And it's, it's, it's one step removed from what you were looking for, but often that's what creativity is all about, mm. is making that one, one step sideways to something that's connected, but not, not obviously so. And, um, yeah, that's, I, I, I think I will now um, continue to... See, some people would call it um, drifting off the point... And, um, and sort of indulging yourself um, by sort of just saying, oh, that looks interesting, um, I'll have a look at that, just in case it might be relevant. And some might see it as kind of time-wasting, and I guess I'm lucky because the work I do is full-time, so I have the time, I can risk a bit of that time exploring um, research materials that may not be absolutely obviously relevant first up but in all sorts of imaginative ways um, or in all sorts of ways can can conjure for me imaginative processes that become very uh, a very useful and important part of of the finished book Mm. and actually I mean I love it you've described it as print gluttony Um, you know certainly this idea of having just sort of collecting all these books where you're not quite sure where the ideas are going to come from and I think what's interesting in contrast, in some sense, in contrast to some of the other discussions we've had in this series, is that your creative process is, is actually quite different because of what you're aiming to achieve at the end. Uh, whereas many other um, researchers are, are researching a very specific point in history and, and trying to actually then write something about all the, the associated facts um, and stories about that moment in time. And I guess ref- sort of indicative of what we've brought along tonight um, is that uh, in many ways, um, Morris wasn't able to actually tell me that some of the names of the books because he had so many. And so in many ways, what we've brought along are related things around some of these themes. And mm. I suppose what I wanted to start with in, in some sense is coming back then to the books that you um, both finished and, and continued to write. Um, the first one was Grace. Um, 
So I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, that process because in as how I understand it, you would have already had a very clear picture of um, that story before you came here. And I'm interested to see how did um, that book get pulled together okay. while you were here. Well, the book that I actually wrote during, during my year here um, is a story called Grace. It's about a girl, uh, an 11-year-old girl, growing up in the suburbs of Australia in a very, very strict fundamentalist Christian community. Not an experience I've had personally and one that I've only been able to learn about by talking to people who've had such an experience. But because I didn't want to write about any one actual existing fundamentalist Christian group, I wanted to write about that experience. But, but um, my interest was that we all go through, every single one of us, a point in our young lives when we start to think for ourselves, when the opinions and attitudes and, and information that we've previously accepted from the authority figures in our lives as being absolutely true or the way we should think, um, we start to question some of these, some of these um, um, governing sort of um, attitudes. And, uh, and it's a necessary and, and wonderful process when we do. And it, you know, it can be a little bit... Um, for parents, it, it, it can be a very interesting time because it's great. I've, I'm a parent myself, and it's, and it's wonderful to have those first few years with your sons and daughters where you're pretty much you know, the expert in everything, and, and, and that you kind of slip into assuming that you are always going to be the expert, and then they start to kind of just question things. And in most families, it's, a, it's, it's an exciting time. But I was particularly interested to think about young people who, um, because of the cultural or, or, or religious um, climate that they're growing up in, that sort of um, independent thought is really frowned on and, in fact, can cause huge conflicts and problems within families and communities. And I took a very extreme example of that. I, I took um, a very rigid fundamentalist Christian community and explored what it would be like to, to grow up there. Now, I knew before I, I came to the library and started my year here that I wanted to explore... I was going to make up my own fundamentalist Christian community based on a number. I didn't want it to be identified as any one existing one because my point wasn't to um, do that. It was, it, 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 it was to create one that was as legitimate and convincing as possible. So I needed to have a look at a whole range of such communities um, as, as they exist in contemporary Australia. And... Uh, and I did that. Um, there are a couple; they, their names may, may come to mind as, as, I, as, as I say this. Who'd been in the media here in this country for a couple of years because of um, some of the family law issues that uh, that arise when um, when errant adult members of those communities, uh, people who start themselves questioning, they sometimes get booted out by the community but their spouse and their children stay members of the community. And this was something that particularly interested me from the child's point of view. Um, these, these children never get to see that parent again, and that parent never gets to see those children again. And uh, so I started um, tracking some, of, some, some examples of this through newspapers and, and other, other media accounts here in the library. But um, I quickly discovered that that, um, that often people who've been booted out of such communities um, want to write at length about their experiences and there are a whole range of books also available that um, I found here. And, uh, um, and I was also, through some of, the, um, some of the printed research I did, I was uh, able to eventually make first-hand contact with some people who'd also had experiences themselves because that's that's always a very useful sometimes quite daunting but a useful um part of research mm. um i suppose then going on to probably the the real kind of main event which is the, the completion of the trilogy with once then and 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 now um how many of you have read books from the trilogy so i think what's really interesting is that that the story of of, of felix and zelda is just so um 
you can't help but want to find out what happens next. And clearly, in looking at that kind of generational change through those stories, um, and given the kinds of um, stories that you can find here at the library, um, what what were some of the, the biggest challenges? Because when you look at things like... Uh, if you're going to write a, a book that has links to the Holocaust, links to the bushfires, I mean, in terms of print gluttony, you could quickly mm, find yourself mm. almost drowning. So how did you cope with well, that? Well, I think the biggest challenge was I had, I had decided to, to um, build the, the final part of the trilogy around the bushfires be- before I started my time here at the library. And that, that had been a huge um, stage of development because I... Before I, I, I knew what the story would be in the third book, I knew I wanted Felix, the 10-year-old boy from the first two books, in, in Once and Then, we, we follow Felix's journeys through Poland in 1942 as a 10-year-old Jewish boy looking for his parents, coming finally painfully to accept that they are almost certainly dead, sharing with him the development of the all-important friendship between him and the, the six-year-old Polish girl, Zelda, who becomes the most important person in his life, in, in, in that crucial year of his life. And, and I knew as I finished the second book that the third book would take a huge jump ahead in time to the current day and that that 10-year-old boy would then be an 80-year-old man and that his story would be told through the eyes and through the voice of a child of around the age that he was in the first two books. And the reason I was doing this was because I wanted this elderly man to have an experience that would allow him to reconnect with some of the painful and unresolved feelings from that very difficult and and traumatic period of his childhood, 70 years earlier. And I knew that Felix would have... uh, at the end of the second book, we leave him still in hiding, making a vow that if he survives those terrible times, he will try and lead a life that will be a kind of testament as, as well as an act of gratitude to some people who've shown him amidst the very worst of human behavior, the very best that we humans are capable of. And when we, I knew that we would meet Felix at the beginning of the third book as somebody who, um, who had come very close to to embodying the very best that we're capable of in his life, that he would have led a long life of great achievement and service. As a paediatric surgeon, he would have helped countless children, saved saved many, many lives. But what I asked myself at at the beginning, or in February um, last year, what experience could this man and his granddaughter have in contemporary Australia that would be so huge, so traumatic, that would present such a huge physical jeopardy as well as an emotional one that it would be big enough to kind of break through the surface of, of, of achievement and, and, um, and, and contribution in this man's life and take him back 70 years to that a particularly painful um, or a hugely painful time. And, and I was pondering this and scratching my head when, when the terrible bushfires started and... Um, and Although, like every Australian, I was initially just horrified and, and deeply concerned and sympathetic for the communities who were being decimated by these, these fires, a little corner of my mind stayed a novelist, and, and I had to admit to myself that I was, I'd found the thing I was looking for. So, so that's where I was when I came to the library. But I was very, very conscious that I was doing one of the trickiest and most presumptuous things that a writer can do, which is to take a very recent, very real, very painful, life-shattering, life-changing series of events for a large number of real people, and I was, I was going to take that into my, my world of fiction, and I was going to use it for a story. Now, I think, I think one is allowed to do that, but there are big responsibilities that go with it, and this is where I needed the help of this library and, and all who sail in her. Um, because I, I wasn't physically present um, in Marysville or, or any, of, any of those other small communities that, 
that, that would change forever. Um, and so I was dependent, as all researchers are, on second-hand material. And fortunately, there was material of all types here. And as you say, there was lots and lots of it. So um, I had to um, be a bit disciplined about how much time I spent and um, how much material I tried to digest. But, but there was a, I had a great um, good fortune, which is I discovered by chance that another research fellow a few offices down from mine um, was, um, was writing a history of Australian bushfires. This was her... Um, this, this, was, this was her research project. This was, this was what, what she, she'd got her fellowship t to do. And so, um, so in the first conversation I had um, with her, um, I also discovered that, that her husband was a volunteer um, bushfire captain, that they lived out right in the path of the fire. And, uh, and so, in an unexpected way, um, but I guess I th it's, it's perfectly legitimate to regard research fellows as one of the you know, resources of the library. I think that's one of the great things about having a research f fellow program. Um, I'm, I must say, perhaps the library could do a, a little more to connect everyday users of the library with the research fellows. Um, Although I guess that could get difficult if there'd been a long queue of people outside my office sort of, you know, <laughs> asking for help with their homework. That kind of may have sort of bogged me down a bit in my, <laughs> in my writing. But certainly it, it, um, it, that was hugely helpful. And, I, um, and, and, and as, as you will see in, in my author's note in the back of Now, the third book in the trilogy, I, I thank Danielle and, and, her, and her husband specifically because they very kindly read the first draft of the book. And... Uh, and in, in a way that, that, that sometimes happens, that, that, that in a way no amount of research can save you from, I, I had made a technical bushfire error in, my, in the first draft of the story, and I had um, the elderly uh, Felix and, and, and young Zelda, his granddaughter, I had them taking shelter in a particular physical circumstance, which I thought from my research would allow them to survive that, that particular time, that, that particular moment, and, um, but I was informed by the experts that they would almost certainly have died at that point. And, uh, and the fact that they didn't in my story, of course, would have, would have been an appalling misjudgment by, by me. So I was able to um, rewrite quite dramatically that, that little section of the story. Um, and, uh, and that's probably, I would say, the most important... Um, piece of assistance I got from the library, the, the, the most important single piece, although um, m much, of the, much of my understanding and much of my ability to imagine what it would be like to be in, in the middle of such a firestorm came directly from the words that I, um, that, that I was able to find here in the library. Mm. And I guess it's one of those um, things too in terms of talking about being able to interact with people that have actually experienced it. Um, in regards to um, stories about the Holocaust, you also went down to the Jewish Museum, is that right? Well, I did, yeah. Um, over the five or so previous years, when I was researching and writing um, Once and Then, the first two books in the trilogy set both of them in Poland in 1942. Um, in fact, it was probably longer than a five-year period because I started writing the first book about five years ago, but... I'd been researching and thinking about that story probably for another five years prior to that. And both the Jewish Museum here in Melbourne, but in particular the Holocaust Museum, because they're, they're, they're here, unlike Sydney, um, the, those two um, Jewish museums are two, in two separate locations. And I live in Carnegie, which is um, fortunately um, only a short tram ride from the, the, the Holocaust Center in Elstonwick. But I also discovered through my time in, in that Holocaust Center that there's another um, wonderful library. Um, and I, I think all libraries in the world are really just kind of cells in one fantastic sort of global library organism. So I don't in any way feel it's inappropriate for me to mention the, the Maycor Library, also in um, Elstonwick, um, or South Caulfield, I think, technically, 
which is a Jewish community library and and has um, has a fantastic collection of books and documents um, covering all aspects of Jewish history, but in particular, of course, um, the Holocaust, and, and, and that was a very, very useful library to me, f- mm. for, for me, yeah. And did you find then, obviously, in, in many ways, there are, there are a lot of similarities in terms of the, the sense of loss, the pain, the, that, you know, that, that sense of scarring that you get from when you hear about stories that happened during the Holocaust, and then having, there, there is indeed that, that, those very same strong links with regards to the bushfires. Um, and I think one of the things that strikes me too is that while um, fresh in our memory are the bushfires from last year, but uh, when you go back through some of the collections here at the library, you also realise that in the other great fires that have happened here in Victoria, the stories and the, the, that sense of pain and loss um, doesn't, doesn't change. And I think probably, um, I suppose, my, my reading of, of things, of, of the trilogy, is that that... that a sense of um, uh, contrast and, but also a sense of connection with, with these stories is something that binds them all together. Is that something, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to, trying to get towards is before you realised that you wanted to use bushfires as, as kind of that pivotal moment, what other things were you, were you hoping to, to achieve through, through uh, now? Well... I know we've only got about half an hour left, and I could t- I could take about four hours to answer that question. But um, one particular area of interest for me, not just in these books, across all the books I've written, really, but in particular, I guess um, this trilogy is the first time I'd I'd, I'd gone back in history. Um, I'd written other books that were um, that in which I asked my 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 young readers to to maybe go geographically to places that they may not have been or even whose existence they, they may have known nothing about, such as Boy Overboard with the family, the two kids and their parents coming from Afghanistan trying to come to Australia as, as refugees. I've, I've long been interested in the notion that although, we, although our world sometimes feels like more of a global village than ever before because... Um, electronically we've got so many media choices and we have access young people have access through the internet in particular to to actually seeing and hearing and and, and getting a sense of so many aspects distant aspects of the world but it's still a difficult thing for us we distance can the the people who are distant from us whether it's over the other side of the globe or you know, 70 years back in history, which I can tell you for the upper primary readers that I that I primarily wrote write for, um, it seems like a very very long time ago. When I started talking to young people about their their kind of thoughts and concepts of history y- years ago, as I was pre- preparing, when I was first thinking about this trilogy, I quickly discovered that um, when you when you say to to a lot of young people and some not so young people too, you know, how do you think it was? You know, 70 years ago, um, and 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 I'll give you a, sort of a, a, few, a few little hints. I used to say, um, you know, no mobile phones, no computers, um, pretty much no TV, etc., um, etc. Et then suddenly, um, some young people are kind of visualising caves and dinosaurs, and um, you know, gnawing on sort of bison bones for dinner, um, because things very quickly seem so far away that we maybe aren't even sure if the people then were really much like us at all. So I wanted... One of the things I think Stories does fantastically well is no matter how far away from home they take us as we go on those journeys with, with, with the characters, we might be way over the other side of the world, somewhere we, we never knew existed, or we may be so far back in time we can barely, barely imagine um, what it was like. But... What we are quickly reminded of is that no matter how different from us on the surface, because of geographical or, or historical difference, the, the people in the story are, we quickly discover that inside them there's some very familiar things going on. There's a whole range of emotions that seem um, to be in no way different from the emotions we have every day, that 
even when humans were sort of you know living in caves and and grappling with um with large animals um in an attempt to eat them they were feeling um amazingly almost exactly what we feel as we grapple in the supermarket for the last um bit of fruit loaf that some other um neanderthal individual is trying to you know get to before us and um so i I can remember day after day sitting in my in my little office here reading what I knew were the real words of real people people who'd survived and in some cases hadn't survived the holocaust people who'd survived um the bushfires and and I was struck every day over those well over all those years of the research including the the year I was here that um that these people had had experiences very far from anything i had physically experienced in my life but the but i was able to connect and identify and empathize and not know exactly what it's like to be in the european holocaust or the bushfires of february 2000 uh, 2009 but 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 come close to it or closer to it than i would have done if i hadn't if those words hadn't been available to me it, and so it means that um that that global library organism i was talking about which we can now access in all sorts of different ways um and in some ways because we can access it them electronically as well as physically it means that we actually can experience them as a global sort of library organism because um we don't have to have you know around the world air ticket to to have access to all the great libraries of the world now um and these libraries collectively are a repository of many things but they are perhaps very importantly i think repositories of human feelings the feelings of people who aren't physically with us in terms of geography and often in terms of in terms of history but their words and their feelings are available to us and it's an incredible storehouse of it's a it's a it's a human treasure beyond measure not just for people doing research for professional or 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 personal but just as people who want to connect with other people people that we don't have physical access to but through through libraries we can have intimate connection with complete strangers and their words will very quickly make us not feel estranged from them at all and i think that's that's a, a fantastic thing we have in our culture mm. well said morris actually i just want to um read to you a paragraph um here and um at the end i'll then tell you um when it's from um so it's just following up this 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 story around around the bushfires in melbourne More than a million inhabitants were subjected to restrictions upon the use of water. Throughout the countryside, the farmers were carting water if such was available for their stock and themselves. The rich plains denied their ben- beneficent rains lay bare and baking, and the forests from the foothills to the alpine heights were tinder. The soft carpet of the forest floor was gone, the bone-dry litter crackled underfoot. dry heat and hot dry winds worked upon a land already dry to suck from it the last least drop of moisture men who had lived their lives in the bush went their ways in the shadow of dread expectancy but though they felt the imminence of danger they could not tell that it was to be far greater than they could imagine they had not lived long enough the experience of the past could not guide them to an understanding of what might and did happen and so it was that when millions of acres of the forest were invaded by bushfires which were almost statewide there happened because of great loss of life and property the most disastrous forest calamity the state of victoria has known these fires were lit by the hand of man 71 lives were lost 69 mills were burned millions of acres of fine forest of almost incalculable value were destroyed or badly damaged and townships were obliterated in a few minutes That was actually taken from the report um on the bushfires of January 1939. 
What I find most incredible and, in, and see, indeed what I think meshes with what you're saying, Morris, is that that could have been written last year. Um, That's right, yeah. Um, this is um, as, as our state government grapples with the um, responsibility of um, <laughs> implementing the uh, recommendations of the Royal Commission. We have to be careful not to be too political here. But um, yes, it would seem that... Um, that uh, big aspects of these terrible fires do seem to um, recur and, mm. uh, it, and it would seem perhaps we have an opportunity to lessen the likelihood of them recurring in quite, quite such a bad way in the future if, 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 if we can get it right. But of course, something that struck me um, and, and it's when, when, when I hear that I'm reminded of this that um, and, and, and this might help us be perhaps um, uh, kind and a, a little kind and gentle to our poor beleaguered state government. The more I read and the more I talked to people about those fires, the more the sheer scale and the fact that our ability to contain and even prevent such things is suddenly you think these are forces that, that are, are unimaginable in their, in their volume and, and, and ferocity. And, um, and I guess that was one of the qualities that made me think that this was an appropriate thing to include in a story that started off against the, the Holocaust. The, the sense of, of um, that much as we, we like to feel that that we are civilised, humane individuals and capable of controlling every aspect of life. There's a lot outside us and inside us that can be quite hard to control sometimes. Mm. I, I just quickly want to say that, that um, as, well as, uh, as well as a library like this being a fantastic resource of, of, of human feeling, it's also a a priceless treasure trove of the of this of of small seemingly insignificant bits and pieces which when you when you stumble across them in context can be fantastically useful and interesting there's a there's a particular document and because i'm disorganized and i didn't actually ever take a record of what the actual document was we weren't able to find it for this evening but it was actually the um it was some procedural documents from a small local bushfire brigade who were a part of, of, of um, the Ash Wednesday um, firefighting um, units. And, and, um, and it, was, it was really useful to me because included in it, it, it was really, it was somebody had obviously at the end of that terrible um, and, and, and huge effort by that particular um, small bushfire brigade, somebody had just kind of bundled together a whole lot of the paperwork um, and, and somebody had, had, had written some little linking paragraphs and it had become like a kind of working history of the experience of that little um, group of, I don't know, four or five fire trucks and, and a couple of dozen men and women over the days um, back in, back in, in, in the... Um, Ash, Ash Wednesday fire and included in it was a transcript of some of the radio um, communications because each of the fire units is keeping constant radio communication with their base and it must have been I think it must have been taped because I, I, every single radio um, broadcast had, had a time and, and, and a lot of them were only seconds apart but you were able to read through across a couple of hours what these trucks that were, these, these units that were right out at the fire front, what they were saying to base and what base was saying to them. And it was, it was it, I guess, raw data really, it, and, but, but, but fantastically useful because without knowing anything specific about the individuals involved, you got a sense of, of the drama of this, of this moment. Mm. Um, I'd, I'd also just like to um, 
if we've got time, just mention the third book that I... Um, I was going to... You were going to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm... Uh, no, 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 no. Authors have, away. To, authors have to do so many solo talks in their careers <laughs> that when they have the luxury of a well-informed and um, um, insightful um, conversation companion, we're often, we, we're often rude and we just kind of go blathering ahead no, anyway. No, the, the, flo the floor um, is yours, Morris. <laughs> okay. The reason I, w I want to quickly mention the third book that I researched while I was here, which is a book that I'm just starting to write at the moment, it's, um, is because when I started researching it, it was, as, as I had told my publishers, the story of a relationship that, that develops in, in contemporary outback Australia between a boy and a camel. And my publishers thought, oh, yes, this sounds like a nice sort of gentle, fun story without too much sort of grief and, um, and uh, human, human stress and anxiety. Um, and they were very pleased about that. And, and, and I felt that that was, that was the story I wanted to write. And, and of course, I quickly discovered, well, I, I, I decided I wanted to write about camels because I'd previously discovered just in, in some chance reading that camels had played a hugely important role in allowing Europeans to... Um, make their lives in, in, in many of the um, interior p regions of Australia probably 30 or 40 years earlier than they would have been able to because um, there, there were plenty of parts of the interior that, that horses just couldn't cut it when it came to transporting the tools and food and medicine and clothing that these communities needed. Camels could do it. By about 1915 or so, once, once trucks were widely available, then, of course, the camels all retired um, and um, and they've been happily having big happy families out in 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 the desert <laughs> ever since. Um, so that's what I started researching, and, and there are I think a, a, a couple of books there about that that fine and proud camelier tradition. But I stumbled on another area that interested me. Now I can't pretend that this area of information was leaning up against the camel books. I think I was just sort of. I must have taken a wrong turning one day, and I found myself in an area of, you know, over over in um, in the um, uh, what I think of as the reading room at the back, not the round one, the other one, um, Redmond, Redmond Barry reading room. Yeah, Redmond Barry, um, a wonderful room. Um, if you if you haven't spent much time there, it, um, there are so many books in there that often I didn't even have to go and order books from the even more vast areas of book storage downstairs or out at um, various secret locations. Um, <laughs> I'm sure as, as, as taxpayers and book lovers, you'll be very pleased to know that if ever the world does blow up um, and only cockroaches survive, hundreds of thousands of books will also survive because they are so securely buried in underground bunkers. That's a wonderful thing to know. Anyway, the Redmond Barry Reading Room has got kilometres of wonderful bookshelves and I took a wrong turning one day on my way to the um, camel section and I found myself in the global financial crisis section. And, um, and once I realised where I was, I hung around there because, like many of the older folk here, I used to have superannuation and, um, and I was kind of interested to see, to try and get my head around where it had actually gone. <laughs> and I became very interested very quickly. I read a couple of books and, and then it went beyond just my own self-interest. I started to think, how, I started to get a sense that the people in Wall Street and, and the big financial centres of the world who were kind of responsible for this were pretty much well-educated and smart. In fact, often they were the best and brightest from the biz their business schools in, in the um, universities of, um, of, of the Western world. And, you know, how did so many people, so many people get it so wrong all at once, I started to think. And, and then I started to realise that, as is so often the case, beneath all of the complexity and incredible kind of um, um, s detailed specialist knowledge were some very simple ideas ideas so simple, I came to think, that an 11-year-old child could probably have told many of these, um, these MBAs and highly, highly experienced um, investment bankers where they were going wrong in some of their really basic ideas. I'll give you one example. I think that a whole generation of very, very smart people in, um, in very big banks and financial institutions forgot a really simple thing that kids learn very young, which is you can't get something for nothing. You look around at nature and there's wonderful things are being created every day but they don't come from nothing and you look around the physical world and 
Um, amazing things happen out there in the in the in the far reaches of, of space. But and things 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 turn into other things. But generally speaking, not from nothing. And uh, so I suddenly became very interested in the notion of of writing a story about um, a child who is very affected by the global financial crisis, but is also in a position to help steer his um, investment banking parents um, back onto the right track. But, and this, this was where having a small room with a couple of hundred books piled up to the ceiling, some about camels and some about, um, about collateralized debt obligations, um, <laughs> you get a kind of a cross-fertilization that um, I, think, I think the books were talking to each other at night when I was at home because I'd come in the next day and there were vibes in the room because I found myself looking at a book about camels and there was a photograph of a camel out in the Australian desert, actually a camel that belonged to a, a, a camel expert that I was able to go to Alice Springs and meet. And it was a photograph of a camel in one of his pens out in Alice Springs. And, and as I looked at this photograph, it was a big um, dromedary, a single humped camel, which is what all the Australian camels are, silhouetted against the blue desert sky. And I was thinking at first, I wonder if you could ride this thing bareback. I wonder if, if you could do it without the very beautiful and complex saddles that are used. And I ran my eye up the tail, and I noticed that there was a bit of a... I'll do it so you can see it. Up the tail. I noticed there was a bit of a ridge behind the hump. I thought, yes, you could probably sit on that, but then you'd have to hang on to the hump and be very careful you didn't slide all the way down that long, graceful neck as the camel's chewing its, its desert grass. And then, I, and then I ran my eye up that profile again, and I thought, good grief, that is the perfect boom and bust financial graph. <laughs> and it was at that moment that I knew that camels would play an important part in my story of how some very sophisticated adults were reminded of some of the important um, uh, traditional simple wisdoms by, by a child and, and a camel. Camels, of course, are also, I think... Um, I think over in Wall Street and uh, Zurich, they could take some lessons from how camels, um, how frugal camels are with their resources. Because, of course, they do drink a lot of water sometimes, but uh, they don't kind of splash it around on Ferraris and uh, weekends, <laughs> weekends in the Maldives. They make it last a very long time. And I think, with the, I think we can all, well, I'm hoping we can all learn something from that. I think you could, you could actually perhaps even look at a, a different... Uh a different career, Morris, and be the, you know, one of those guru speakers that uses the camel as the, uh, well, the, the metaphor. <laughs> yeah, I, um, there, are, there is a need for such speakers, um, but given a choice between spending the rest of my career with um, merchant bankers or upper primary readers, I think, I'll, I think <laughs> the upper primary readers I prefer. I, I think we'd be very <laughs> glad that you did so too. Actually, no, do, do, we, do we have a title yet for that book? Are you... We don't. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of tossing a few titles around. But I, I, I learned a long time ago not to agonize over titles too much. Um, once I've embarked on that imaginary journey with, with my character, um, if I focus on the journey and the best way to, to um, recount that in a story, I, I generally find that the title kind of finds me sooner or later. And um, um, it makes my publishers a bit nervous because they plan months and years ahead and they like to have titles on their schedules rather than Morris Gleitzman's next book. But, um, but they've, they've, they've learned to sort of trust the process. Um, and yes, yeah, so the, the, there will be a title at some stage. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I, I want to leave time for people to be able to come and have a look uh, at some mm. of the things we've brought along as well as have a, a bit of a further chat with you, Morris. So at this point... I want to thank you for, for sharing with us your journey uh, of your time here at the library and, and your creative process for, for writing um, the books that, you, that you've begun and finished and, and continue to write. Um, so would you please join with me in, in thanking Morris for coming along thank tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just look, to, to oh. just add to your print, print gluttony, um, uh, we have a small uh, book as a thank you. This is our collection, uh, World of the Book, which is highlights all the sorts of things that you can find here in the State Library of Victoria. So this actually is quite compact by comparison. It's a good coffee table book. It's beautiful. Look, as we've been talking, I've been eyeing it and thinking, I must borrow that, but I had no <laughs> idea that um, that's very kind. Thank you. No, thank I'd you like to us. add my thanks to all these thanks. Once again, I'd like to thank the library. I think the research fellowship programs are a wonderful one. And if 
any of you with some research time ahead of you in your lives aren't already prompted to have a go at getting one of those offices for yourselves for a while, this, this, this should cap it because in what I think was one of the, well, probably the single proudest moment of my entire life, when I arrived here on day one of my fellowship and I was taken down into the bowels of the library to the, um, to the security office to be given my, my, my pass card so that I could, um, I was, I can't remember what time the library officially opens each morning, but, but when you work here, you get to come in an hour earlier than that if you want to. As it happens, it wasn't it was something I ever availed myself of because I'm not that good early in the morning. But it was. But when they gave me my pass card, just the standard little card with the photo, which you get to wear around your neck, on it, it said, Morris Gleitzman, scholar. <laughs> oh, how I wanted to flash back in time 50 years to my, um, to my high school in London, to a group of well-meaning and, and, and benighted teachers who I fear um, most of them aren't with us anymore. I can guarantee I would have been the pupil in that year that they would have least expected ever to have the word scholar appended to his name. So I've still got it hanging up in my office, that card. I'm sure I should have returned it, but I didn't. Um, it's because I'm going to keep it forever and ever. And um, if, ever, if ever somebody, some future journalist is trawling through my belongings trying to get sort of an insight into who I really was, I hope they ignore all the other stuff and just <laughs> scholar. Just lovely, Morris. I yes. love it. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Morris. And uh, please come and have a chat with Morris yeah. and have a look at some of the things we've brought along tonight. Thank you very much for coming on a very cold, wet evening. Cheers. Good night. <laughs>